What do you suppose would happen if a god became a human? Would she have powers that no one else has? Would she be able to explain puzzles that have bothered humans forever? Would she <laughs> ignore religious traditions and customs? Would she be accepted by anybody? No, I think everybody would want to kill her. And the Marvel writers got this right. And the stories, don't, doesn't everybody want to kill the Marvel characters? <laughs> yeah, that seems to be the way it goes. Why do they want to do that? It's because humans are frightened of people with such spectacular powers. And that fright makes them want to kill them. So, no matter how much good such a character would do, he or she would be rejected, even by their own hometown. And that's exactly what happened to Jesus. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus performs great wonders and works of power. He heals and, and rescues people. He also explains a great many things that have puzzled people about the kingdom of God. But he's rejected. He's rejected by the plotting of the religious leaders with their arch enemies, the Herodians, who are collaborators with Rome. Then he's rejected by Gentiles whom he had gone over to the other side of the lake to try to help and they, he healed a demon-possessed man and they asked him to leave. So he did. Then finally, although huge crowds followed him everywhere, he's finally rejected by his own hometown and even his own family. It's a tragic story. But it has a surprise ending. <laughs> well. That'd make it a good Marvel story, wouldn't it? Yeah, but we're not at the end of Mark yet. In today's story, we're at that hometown of Jesus. Let's read it. It's in Mark 6, 1 to 6. And then we'll explore some details and some implications. So, starting with verse 1 then. He went away from there, which is Capernaum, and came to his hometown, which of course is Nazareth. And his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and among his relatives in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Well, the Gospel of Luke also has this story. Of course, it's in a different place. Perhaps it was an earlier visit when Jesus came to Nazareth because in this account of Luke, he doesn't have any disciples with him. And uh, he, he made everybody mad because he wouldn't do the many miracles for them that he was doing in, in Capernaum. And so they tried to throw him off a cliff. But we're not in Luke. We're in Mark. We're in the second section of Mark to be precise. The first section ended in chapter 3, verse 6, with those religious leaders plotting against him. And the second section then starts with Mark chapter 3, verse 7, which has Jesus selecting his 12 disciples. His family tried to abduct him and because he was, they, they thought he was crazy. And he taught the crowds and his disciples. And he did ever more amazing miracles culminating with raising a girl from the dead. 
But this victorious section in Mark ends in a, well, it's an ironic semi-climax. In, in his own hometown, Jesus could do no mighty works. Why? Because they didn't believe in him, Mark says. This is a tragic story. Can we even get behind or understand how tragic it is? What rejection Jesus felt from his own neighbors and family and it must have really hurt. Maybe it's because this time he comes as a well-known rabbi, even accompanied by a posse of disciples, no less. The reader, of course, naturally expects that uh, his hometown is going to be very impressed with him and, and see even greater works, even greater than what he did in Capernaum, because this is home. It's home people. Well, apparently some of them did believe in him. Apparently some of the townspeople had traveled to Capernaum and saw what he was doing. I mean, it's only 20 miles away, so it would be a walk, but that's what they did. And it had uh, amazed them to see what Jesus was doing there. Others had heard about it too, apparently. Mark writes, many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What wisdom is given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hand? So, there were apparently many in town who acknowledged the wisdom and power of Jesus. But the problem is they didn't know where it came from. Was it from God or was it from the devil? The religious leaders were all saying it was from the devil. The townspeople, they, well, they knew him, but they knew him from when he was growing up, you know, as a, as a kid. And then later as the, the handyman, the guy who could fix anything, right? They call him a carpenter here, but he, he made plows, he fixed wheels, he built wheels, like he could build a house. That's Jesus. That's what they knew. It's just this guy in town who could fix everything. He wasn't trained as a rabbi. He wasn't trained as a teacher of the law. Why doesn't he just stay in his place instead of elevating himself like this? And he's gallivanting all over the place, pretending to be a rabbi. And he's got this retinue of disciples, no less. Who is this guy now? So in verse 3, the townspeople insult him. It may have been another group. I don't know. But anyway, they say, isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and instead of the son of Joseph, the son of Mary, that's kind of an insult as well in that culture, and his brothers of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Well, <laughs> at least they didn't try to throw him off a cliff this time. Now, we come to the point Mark is making. It's a sobering truth about how God deals with people. So see what Jesus says in verse 4 through the first part of verse 6. He says, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household, and he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Jesus, this is a, a common saying that he's adapted for this occasion. You know, we do that with common sayings, don't we? His own family didn't believe in who he was and what he was doing. Mary? Did she not tell anybody who he is? Or did she forget? It was a long time ago. Earlier, when he was teaching and healing in a house, they even were on the outside of the house calling him to come out so they could abduct him because they thought he was out of his mind or possessed. <sighs> well, 
they felt that he was bringing dishonor to his family. And this is a whole shame-based society, you know. Bringing shame to your family? So at that time, he expanded his concept of family. He, he looked around at the circle of people with him, listening to him teach, and he said that his biological family were outside, and the people inside were those in the circle around him. The inside, those were his real family. Mark uses this inside-outside thing through his gospel. There's an important question that arises from what Mark says about this episode. It says, he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Here's the problem or the question. Was Jesus unable to do any mighty work or was he unwilling to do any mighty work in that environment? The uh, commentators I read, very few want to admit that he was unable to do anything, even though that's what the translators say. They want to say that he was unwilling to do so in the circumstances of unbelief. The outside are not family because they don't believe in him. Well, it, it makes sense, I guess, if you... Remember that believing and the word faith, they mean trusting God. If you don't trust God, well, I guess he's not going to do anything for you. He can't, sort of. So, whether or not we trust God is pivotal to what God will do. Jesus couldn't do any mighty works because the people didn't trust him. Rather than trusting him, they were offended by him. Now, there is something that bothers me here. The story said he could do no mighty work, but he could heal people? Isn't <laughs> I would think of healing as a mighty work, wouldn't you? But I guess not. So, what were those mighty works he was doing in Capernaum? Well, out in the sea, he, uh, with his disciples and others in the boats around them, he just stopped a storm. <laughs> just boom. And he raised a girl from the dead. I mean, I'd call those mighty works, wouldn't you? But exercising demons? That is a whole different level. That is a direct frontal attack on Satan's kingdom. That's a mighty work. But not healing. I think most Christians would think of healing as some kind of mighty work. Well, we don't believe him for healing, even if we want to. Sometimes we want to desperately. I don't think he will. I think Mark is addressing his own church here. And us. I don't think he knew he was addressing us, because this is just for his church, right? But Mark reports that the disciples were constantly amazed at what he did. But he said that he was constantly amazed at them. What? You don't understand yet? And where is your faith, he says to his disciples. Lack of trust is constant and consistent in the disciples and in the church and us. Even though we think we believe, I, I think we need to examine our hearts to see if we really do trust God. It's strange, though. It's it.
that the church called the body of Christ doesn't trust Christ? How weird is that? Well, the writer of the book of Hebrews calls it disobedience. Ooh, that hurts. Now, he says it quite plainly to his, to his believers that read his book. His listeners, actually, they were hearing these things, not so much reading them. Here's what he says, though. Hebrews 3, 12 to 19, he says, Take care, brothers, lest there be any of you with an evil, unbelieving heart. He's talking to the church. Leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. You see, they've been lied to. They've been lied to. That's why they don't believe. For we have come to share in Christ. If indeed we hold to our original confidence firm to the end, as it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. He's talking about Israel there. And so he continues talking about that, the Exodus, really. For those who heard and yet rebelled, was it not those who left Egypt, led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned and whose bodies fell on the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who were disobedient. So we see they were unable to enter because of unbelief. It's the same thing. Do you see what the writer has done? He says God's people don't trust God. He says unbelief in the church, that lack of faith, is being disobedient to God. The God we claim to worship are being disobedient because we don't trust him. So the problem with the disciples and with the church is the same problem that the townspeople of Nazareth had. The townspeople wanted to remain comfortable with the Jesus they thought they knew. Not this one. Not this rabbi who could do anything, apparently. They didn't want this one. They didn't believe in him. It turns out that they didn't really know him at all. Well, and he was astonished at their lack of trust, their lack of faith, their lack of belief. I think he was really sad and hurt by it. These are his own family. Is he, is he also so disappointed in his church? It's supposed to be his body of Christ. Is he astonished at us that we, what, you don't understand yet? What, you don't trust me yet? What, what keeps us from not trusting Jesus? You know, it's not a new problem. There, in the Bible, it's, there's this guy whose son was, demon was throwing him into the fire, and he asked Jesus to exercise this demon, and Jesus says, sure, if you believe. And the guy says, I do believe. Help my unbelief. And that's, that's the cry of our heart. I do believe. Help my unbelief. Okay, well, his disciples were watching all this. They haven't been mentioned again since the beginning of this little story. But he had given them authority already to heal diseases and cast out demons. So they knew this power was from God. Now their apprenticeship is over. Now they were prepared to go on their own, knowing that 
even in Jesus' hometown, where one would think that they would be most accepted and most inclined to believe in Jesus, at least as much as they did for him to fix the broken wheels on their cart, they didn't believe in him at all. And the disciples saw that. That's the disciple. That's the lesson the disciples learned that day. They now know that they too will encounter disbelief even from their own brothers and sisters. From They'll encounter persecution from their own families, from their own hometown, from their neighbors, grandparents, parents, brothers, sisters, cousins. They know that now. Luke talks about this. It's Luke 14, 25 to 27. Jesus warned all those crowds, those wannabe disciples that were following him around. He says, he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not, now he's going to be exaggerating here, okay, so don't take this literally, but having known what we just saw, you know what this means. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. This is radical. This is radical commitment. We have lost sight of this. I think some of you who are watching this video have experienced the same rejection. Or maybe even death threats. From who knows, everyone? Even your family? I've read so many accounts of people coming to trust Jesus and their family, wanting to kill them. But here's the thing. Jesus is now the foundation of your life. So even if you die, you are not gone, you're with him. He's your foundation. So no way could I set him aside to appease my family, my friends, my neighbors, my hometown, anybody in the community. The disciples had learned that their walk of faith was not going to be a rose garden. They thought they were going to rule the nations like a rose garden. Well, they learned that their rose garden had thorns. Well, well all we can do, we keep on trusting God. Because we, we know, we do know Him. Don't we? We're inside His house, right? We're not outside. We are the family of God. You're in the family of God. His Holy Spirit lives within you. Trust Him. Whatever's going on in your life, trust Jesus. Amen.